Hello there everyone, welcome to another episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast. This is the weekly series in which we relive and retell your true scary stories. We've got episode 80 today, which means it's time once again to give you some chills. Now, if you're a fan of this sort of thing and you want to be featured for an upcoming episode, then make sure to send in your story at tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Just make sure that story hasn't been sent in to another narrator or posted anywhere online. That way we can keep everything fresh and new. Anyways, enough of that. Let's begin. Number 1. I'm not done yet. Hello, creepy fox. I remembered you needed stories and thought of one myself my friend Alex and I had. Before I begin, I want to shout out Spunky the Nutcase. Such a quality name. Anyways, this took place in the summer of 2019. Like any adventures of teenagers, the routine was wake up, ride bicycles, eat lunch, ride bicycles again, then watch a movie to end the day, then repeat for at least 60 days. But this one day was different. My friend and I were hungry, so we decided to stop at the local McDonald's for dinner and bring it back to his house to watch a movie. At this time, we were hyped for It 2 to release, and we were already prepared for Halloween. But at McDonald's, a middle-aged, short, mysterious-looking man walked into the store and sat parallel to us. We didn't think much of it, and we let it be. Once they called us for our order, we ended up leaving. When we were riding our bicycles back, Alex recognized the man in a zookeeper-like suit about 70 yards behind us. We sped up a little bit, and we thought we lost him. Or, so we thought. Now, Alex's house is very unique. He has a window right behind where his TV is, and he can see a lot of the neighborhood from that window. Well, 20 minutes into our movie, we're into our goodies, and Alex again points out the man from the McDonald's, walking down the road in our direction. You think he sees us, Alex? Get down! Alex said. Do, do, you, do you think he saw us? I stated back nervously. Probably not, but let's go check. We peeked up from the ground, but nobody was there. Now, Alex's mom was home, but we didn't want to annoy her. Ten minutes later, I'm going to go get some water from the garage. Suddenly, I looked back, and the man with the sunglasses has a smile, and he's looking right at us. He pounds at the window, and we get Alex's mom. She doesn't believe it, and of course, when we go back, he's gone. I wasn't comfortable going home, as I would have to ride my bicycle. So I decided to sleep over, and this is when things really went downhill. Alex and I were still aware the man was still out there, and could still even be on the lookout for us. At two in the morning, we hear a rock hit the window. Oh no, Alex mumbled to me. We peek out the window to see nothing except the darkness of the night. But this next part is most disturbing. All of a sudden, we hear the back door open. Oh golly, Alex said. I didn't lock the door. So we armed ourselves with Nerf guns, just as a precaution. Now keep in mind, these are modded from the 6th grade, and these things could leave a scar and travel at a fast speed. Alex is on the phone with the police, and we're hiding in his room, where we could get the man from two angles if he came in. When the police arrived, they searched the property. They find nothing. But they did find a butcher's knife and a paper that said, I'm not done yet, with a smiley face. We haven't heard of the man since, but I'll update you all if something comes up. Number 2. Delivery Gone Wrong I'm your average ordinary college student who just started getting into the food delivery service. It's a nice extension to my busy college life, which sees me studying into the late hours. It's also a very easy job. All you have to do is get the food, drive over to the person's house, and whammo, you make the delivery. Sometimes those deliveries can become quite the uncomfortable story, and that's what I'm here to tell you all about. Early last year, I just started my delivery route for the evening when I decided to accept an offer for food delivery for a poke bowl. If you don't know what those are, I can assure you it has nothing to do with Pokemon. I can't tell you how many times people will say that when they hear poke. Anyways, the home was about 20 minutes from the store out on the city limits. 
I recognized the area as a pretty bad side of town that had actually just been in the news due to a gas station robbery. Not exactly my cup of tea, but hey, what could possibly go wrong? I arrived at the Poke Bowl store being greeted by the friendly cashier before picking up the food order, saying my goodbye, and hopping back into my truck. I now begin the drive through the busy nightlife of my town, listening to some classic rock and talking to my girlfriend over the phone. By the way, it had just started to rain pretty heavily, which made the trip that much longer. Let's just say the homeowner was furious when he sees me walk up to the front door. I'll summarize what he said, but he pretty much cursed me out, telling me how bad a service I'd done for him, and that it was my responsibility to get to him faster. Mind you, I'm trying to remain as calm as I can, telling him that if he had any issues, he was more than welcome to call the customer service line. Apparently, that wasn't enough. While leaving the door open, he steps into his home, disappearing behind a wall. I was starting to get a bit nervous because of how intimidating he was acting, which is why I placed the food on his outdoor patio bench. I then begin to make my way back to my truck. I'm not even joking. Just as I'm about to open the driver's side door, the dude comes back with a metal bat, and he begins chasing after me. More name calling is used and I'm frantically trying to put the key in the ignition, but in my panic, I drop it underneath the wheel. The man now attempts to open the passenger side door, but I had the smarts of locking it. Then, in a totally unexpected move, he starts to hit the door with his metal bat. He even manages to smash the window, and glass goes flying everywhere. Luckily it doesn't reach me, but that doesn't mean I'm not trying to lose it. Finally, I start the truck, and I put the pedal to the metal, flooring it. As one final act of revenge, I actually managed to drench the dude with a muddy puddle. Serves him right. Anyways, I drove straight to the police station, and I explained the scary situation I'd just gone through. I then called my dad, who kept me company, while the police went to that man's home. In short summary, the man was questioned and was forced to pay for the car repairs. Apparently, the dude had been drinking and was intoxicated, which I guess sort of made sense. But why would you lash out at your food delivery guy? I don't know, but I still deliver food today. And I haven't had anything as remotely close to this happen again. Number 3. Neighboring Dogs to the Rescue Hi there everyone, I've been following the creepy fox for quite some time, but I haven't really thought about submitting my story. I figured now would be a good time for me to share it, so I hope you'll enjoy and learn something from my mistakes. For some context, this occurred about 5 years ago in New Mexico. I'm a 25 year old female, but at the time this took place, I was 20. I'm about 5 foot 3, 105 pounds with long dirty blonde hair and green eyes, not the most intimidating person in the world. Now, while still attending college, I was working for a grocery store part-time on the weekends. My dad was actually the one who recommended the job, since he knew the manager and thought it would be a perfect fit. Admittedly, I was a pretty shy girl, and I guess I still sort of am. This means certain situations can have me locked up in fear. Anyways, this one Saturday I'd been working. My dad ended up driving me to work, because my car was currently having its yearly maintenance done. He told me he would be more than happy to pick me up, but it would take him at least two hours after my shift ended. My mom wasn't able to pick me up, since she doesn't know how to drive. Now, this wouldn't have been a problem. Until I had to remind my dad I needed to get home as quickly as I could, because of an online assignment due later that evening. Yes, I had procrastinated, but what other college student doesn't do that? So, I was left with two options. Wait it out and risk losing points on my paper for being tardy, or calling an Uber. I was very close to calling Uber, but I'm not too good with one-on-one -on -one interactions with strangers. Therefore, I decided I would take the city bus. Yes, there are more people, but at least I wouldn't be alone. Also, it's way cheaper. Looking back, I wish I would have taken the Uber. So I wait by the bus stop looking at my phone as a distraction and the bus gets to me within 10 minutes. It's about a 30 minute bus ride to the closest bus stop next to my home. 
Then from there, it's like two minutes to the front doorstep. Everything is going fairly smoothly as I sat in the back of the bus while about ten people in total sat toward the front. I think if anything, I looked pretty suspicious, sitting in the corner with my earphones on. About four or five stops before mine while listening to music and looking out the window, I get the whiff of Axe Cologne. I only recognize the smell because my brother uses way too much of it, still not sure why. Anyways, then I feel the seat next to me move. Great. Out of all the spots on the bus, you just had to sit next to me. Annoyed, I take a quick glance over my shoulder, and I'm met with the creepiest smile I'd ever seen. There was a man holding onto a skateboard. He looked to be in his early 30s. He was skinny, wore your typical skater clothing, had a red beanie, and wore large sunglasses too. Hey there, gorgeous. How are you doing? I hear him more or less say, with the music muffling the rest. Now, I have no problem with giving people compliments. In fact, considering all the bad things people go through, you'd be surprised how a nice comment can make somebody's day. But the way he said it made it seem so insincere. And I wasn't trying to jump to conclusions. I just had this overall panic come over me. That told my brain, you need to get out of this situation if it's the last thing you do. Anyways, I give him my thanks, thinking that would be the end of the conversation. But he actually has the nerve of taking one of my earbuds out of my ear. And then saying, What are you listening to? Must be a good song. He states, as he then puts the earbud into his ear. Which side note, I ended up throwing out those earbuds. I forget which song it was, but it was definitely one of the openings from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, as a friend of mine was the one who got me into it. And I was hooked. The man was confused by the music, which I don't really blame him. And then he changes the subject. Do you live around here? If you got some time, want to go get a drink? I'll buy. How I wish I had some stand abilities like the world, so I could have stopped time and gotten out of there. If you're a JoJo fan, you'll know what I mean. Anyways, I told him I wasn't interested, but he's being very persistent with his requests. Luckily, my stop was just a minute away which gave me the perfect excuse to get away from him. The dude actually follows me to the front of the bus and says this was going to be a stop. Yeah, right. He had just gotten on. I'm pretty sure that was a lie. Either way, I wasn't going to stick around to find out. The bus door is open and I step out onto the concrete, quickening my pace. Well, guess who was following me? Yep, skater boy. Those next couple of minutes felt like an eternity. But little did I know just how quickly the situation was about to escalate. Without warning, I see him go into a full-on sprint, now brandishing what looked to be like a switchblade. I remember letting out a gasp as I jumped into the backyard of one of the neighbors. I chose that house in particular because I knew they had two German shepherds, plus the homeowner is a retired army veteran that my family is friends with. Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, I need your help. Someone's chasing me with a knife, I say out of breath, as I see him watering some flowers. Meanwhile, as two German shepherds approach me, looking for a good pet and a scratch. This definitely wasn't the time and place. Myself, the dogs, and Mr. Anderson, my neighbor, approach the fence, and we can see the guy booking it across the street. I now catch him up on my situation, and we ended up calling the local police station. They took our statements and within the hour, they've got their man. I'm happy to report, I have never seen him again, and I now have pepper spray and a small knife for self-defense anywhere I go. Number 4. Sensed from a mile away. So let me go ahead and start off with a few points. First off, I'm going to rewind roughly 15 years ago to around 2004-2005 when I was in high school. At the time, I lived in a small and quiet town out in Arkansas where everyone knew each other. It was pretty common, and I'm pretty sure it's just as common today, to leave doors and windows unlocked. There's just this overall trust system, which is why no one ever felt the need for the added security. I remember during this time period, I was picking up little jobs here and there, so I could save up to buy my first car. One that I enjoyed the most was dog-sitting. This one family in particular had the cutest dachshund in the world named Emily. She was super friendly, 
Unless, of course, you were a stranger. She would bark at you and growl, and even try to bite. That's why at first it took a while to gain her trust, but before I knew it, we were fast friends. This behavior of hers will be important to remember. Anyways, I get a call from this family asking if I could take care of Emily, as they were going to take a staycation at this hotel slash casino, and they wouldn't be back until the next morning. They also told me I was more than welcome to spend the night at their place, and anything in the refrigerator was mine for the taking. But that wasn't the best part. They would pay me a hundred dollars just for that one night. What a score. Even my parents were jealous. Anyways, fast forward to later in the evening. And it just started raining and the echo of the water droplets splashing against the rooftop complimented the comedy movies Emily and I were watching. I had even built this huge fortress made up of warm pillows and blankets. And Emily and I sat in the middle with a bunch of snacks. Honestly, it couldn't have gotten any better. Warm bed... Snacks, movie, rain, sweet dog, what a life. But of course things were about to take a turn for the worse. At around 11.30pm I would shut the TV off. It was still raining pretty heavily and Emily and I were wrapped in the blankets. I was on my laptop playing some games with the blue glow of the screen shining against my glasses. Out of nowhere Emily wakes up and I see all the hairs on her back stand up. She then begins to let out this low growl with some woof sounds here and there. I asked her what was wrong and then she jumps off of the bed and starts scratching at the door. It's then followed by whining, usually indicating she needed to go potty. Now here's the deal. As soon as I open the door, she runs at top speed down the hallway. This actually scared me since I'd never seen her act this way before. I run after Emily and just when I'm about to turn the corner, I hear her bark. This kind of bark was like none I'd ever heard before. Even when I first met her, she wasn't as aggressive. This was the sort of bark a dog would make when they're about to go on the offensive. Well, I found out why. Sporting all dark clothing, with a face mask, flashlight, and a knife, was a burglar. Emily pretty much chases the dude out of the house, and I catch the last part where he runs out the back glass sliding door. Talk about savage. She even runs out of the house, but she comes back after a few seconds. I can't even begin to describe how paranoid I became. How was it that I didn't hear him enter the house? It seemed the heavy rain had masked his footsteps. But you know what they say about a dog's intuition? They can sense danger from a mile away. And I feel Emily did just that. Who knows what would have happened if Emily wasn't there with me that night and what the burglar would have done. Anyways, I ended up calling the police, but they never caught the guy. Edit. All these years later, now with a family and two kids, we have our own dachshund and we've named her Emily. We love her so much. Number 5. Driving with the Creepy Fox for context, I'm female and I was 27 when this took place. Now let me begin. I've been listening to scary stories here on YouTube for a little under a year and I've fallen in love with the videos. There's just this overall joy I feel after working all day and then seeing my favorite narrator the creepy fox upload a new video. Combined with some food, a couch, it's all I could ask for. However, little did I know the creepy fox was going to be part of my scary encounter. Now I don't mean he was actually there with me, which if I ever meet the guy I'm gonna give him a huge hug and tell him thank you for the videos, but I mean he was there via his voice. This is what I'm talking about. This was about six months ago. I just left my uncle's house in Las Vegas and I was making the 180-ish mile drive back to my home in San Bernardino, California. You can already picture it in your head, but driving in a desert highway in the middle of the night means the only thing keeping you company are your headlights. Oh yeah, and the stars and the moon above you. You might occasionally see another vehicle, but for the most part you're on your own. There was one part of my drive I hadn't seen any vehicles for at least 20 minutes, which was perfect atmosphere for what I was listening to. No, I didn't have the radio on playing the greatest hits. But instead, I had an episode of the Creepy Fox playing via Bluetooth. 
While I got the chills listening to some Home Alone stories, I was startled by headlights in my rear view mirror. These lights were powerful, and I couldn't believe the driver needed the high beams on full blast. I could understand if he didn't know I was there, but I was sure I was within his line of view. Well, the driver starts to get closer, and I'm thinking he's trying to pass me. Whatever, I'm in no rush to get home. About 15 to 20 seconds later, he's a mere inches from my back bumper, and I'm starting to get pretty angry. I could care less if the bumper got scratched, but he's too close for comfort. Seeing as no one was on the other side of the highway, I quickly move my vehicle to try and avoid him, but he follows suit. I go back to my original spot moments later, and he does the same, only this time, he starts to flash his lights on and off. This usually indicates they're trying to get you to stop. I know what you're going to say. By no means should I have stopped. And looking back, I would take my advice any day. But seeing as I think I'm this tough girl who isn't afraid of anything, I let go of the gas and slowly come to a stop. The other driver does the same. What's your problem? What do you want? I yell from my driver's window. I get the chills because now with the lights set to normal, I recognize the vehicle and the driver. Same Hummer I'd seen at a gas station right before I left Vegas. The dude jumps out of his Hummer and he starts to approach me with, wait for it, a baseball bat. Yeah, I've got a problem. You cut me off earlier at the gas station. Who's the one with the problem now? My mind then flashes back to the gas station and how yes, admittedly, I had cut him off, but it was by accident. I just couldn't believe he was following me the whole time, and with his lights off, and he waited until we were in the middle of nowhere to get closer and make his presence known. Well, I didn't stick around to fight. Yeah, you could call me a chicken all you want, but the dude has a baseball bat. I think I might have caught him off guard because he was very slow to react. I gained quite a lot of ground and ended up pulling over at a rest area where I could see about five vehicles. Maybe the drivers could back me up. Luckily, I didn't have to worry because the guy in the Hummer drove away. After about 30 minutes, I gained the confidence to continue my trip home and I never saw the guy in the Hummer again. Edit. Thank you, Creepy Fox, for continuing to make videos. Keep up the great work. Number 6. Motel Break-In My son was actually the one who introduced me to your channel about two weeks ago, and I'm hooked on the stories. I've already binge-watched at least half your videos. I did see you had an email where listeners can send in their own stories, so I wanted to go ahead and send you mine. This happened to me sometime in the summer of 1989, when I just graduated from college. My parents had rewarded this accomplishment in my life by getting me my very first car. Better late than never, I guess. Being 23 years old, all my friends had their own cars, and they drove everywhere they wanted to. As for the type of car, my parents ended up getting me a Ford Thunderbird that I drove almost non-stop. However, I usually stuck to driving around my small town and sometimes going to visit friends in neighboring cities. Even so, I felt as if something was missing. Sure, I had a car and a degree in communications, but I just felt the need for more. One day I went to visit my grandparents, and my grandpa told me about the time himself and my grandmother drove across the United States on a road trip. Bingo. It's like a light switched in my head. What I needed to do was see the world. For too long I was stuck with the routine of going to school and going back home. Therefore, later that evening, I tell my parents about my plan to road trip across America, and to my surprise, they were all for it. So, after about a week of planning, I get a suitcase filled with an extra set of clothes, and I embark on my adventure. I would start on the west coast, Washington state to be exact. Then, I would drive south to California. From there, I would head east from LA, going to Las Vegas, then the middle of the country, and when all was said and done, I'd get to New York and make the trip back home. The first half of the road trip was wonderful. I got to see many landmarks I had read about in books, and I even made friends. There was even this really nice family I met in Colorado when I attended a town fair. 
They invited me to stay over at their house, and they ended up gifting me this hand-knit sweater that the mom had made. Really goes to show you the kindness in people. Which side note, I wish more people were like that today. I feel like in today's modern age, there's just always so much fighting. It's like, relax people, be nice to each other. <sighs> seriously. But I digress. I want to go ahead and fast forward to the way back home. This was in Wyoming. It was late in the evening and I struggled to keep my eyes open as rain hit my windshield. I almost considered stopping at a rest area, but my back was telling me otherwise. Therefore, I stopped at a Motel 6 that was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. The motel was accompanied by a gas station, which I'd stopped at first to use the restroom. From there, I go ahead and check into the motel, and I get a key for the second floor. The room I was given was small, but considering I was just going to sleep and then leave, it would have to do. Nevertheless, I hop into the shower and spend about 30 minutes letting the hot water soothe my aching pains. Once I'm in my pajamas, I call my parents before hopping into bed, falling asleep to the static of the small little Sony TV. Now, everything up to this point has been very solid, nothing scary or creepy to report, and I wish I could tell you it remained that way, but this isn't a scary story for nothing. Around 2 in the morning, I wake up to what sounds like my door handle jingling, and I get the shock of a lifetime. The front door slowly opens, and from my bed I see someone with a face mask and a knife. I went cold, as I laid there as perfectly still as I could, thinking, how was I going to get out of the situation? I don't even know what this stranger's intentions are. My best guess was that they might have been attempting to open doors so they could come in and rob people. It just so happened my door was the one they were successfully able to open. Time seemed to have come to a standstill as I watched this stranger walk over to the dresser across from the bed and grab my wallet. Bear in mind, I don't think he knew I was awake because, again, I'm trying to keep as perfectly still as I could. Then, the masked stranger walks toward the restroom where I had left the light on. It's because the room was way too dark and I'd bumped into the corner of the bed just a couple of hours earlier. I still believe to this day that this burglar, if you want to call him that, thought I was in there. With enough space in between us, I quietly hop out of bed and I run down the stairs barefoot with my pajamas. By some sort of miracle, I see a police officer parked next to the gas station and he's sitting in the driver's seat. Let's just say I think I may have given that officer a scare of a lifetime because he jumped out of his seat and spilled his coffee. I think seeing this girl with her hair all over the place and looking as if she saw a ghost can get even to the most bravest of individuals. Anyways, after explaining there's a guy who broke into my motel room with a knife, he calls for backup before walking over to my room. Thankfully, it ends peacefully and the man is handcuffed and arrested before the officer's backup arrives. As for sleep, I finally got some hours later when my paranoia finally had settled. The rest of the way back home was uneventful, and I carried on with my life, going on to have a family. So, that's my story. Number 7. Clown Walks Into My House Even today as I write this out to you, I still can't believe this actually happened. In a way, it's laughable, but don't let that description fool you. This was very creepy, and I haven't had something as remotely close to this happen again. This was around October of 2016, when that whole dumb clown stuff started happening. I won't get into too much of a description since you can look it up yourself. But essentially, people were dressing up in clown costumes and scaring people. I like to think of them as individuals who have way too much free time on their hands. So why is it that when I'm minding my own business, I have something happen to me? Well, there I was home alone studying in my room as my parents had been away for their wedding anniversary, keeping me company as my golden retriever Danny, who laid next to me playing with his toys. At about 8pm, I had now been studying for approximately 4 hours straight and I realized I was starving. I was too lazy to cook, which is why I thought about ordering a pizza from Domino's. Less than 45 minutes later, the delivery is made and I sat in my kitchen watching a movie on Netflix. Where I sat, I have a perfect view of the back glass sliding door. 
There is a large curtain that blocks my view of my backyard, but because there is an automated back porch light, anyone who might be walking outside would get illuminated and their shadow would appear against the curtain. I mention this detail because we get a lot of raccoons and other wildlife whose shadows will occasionally scare the living daylights out of me. Anyways, with my pizza finished, I head toward the trash can, only to realize it was full. Annoyed, I change it for a new bag, and this is when something occurs. As my back is turned against the back door, the wall right next to me suddenly flashes. That was followed by Danny barking and growling. I was sure it might have been our raccoon friends, which is why I turn around to catch their shadows. But what I saw wasn't a shadow of a furry little friend. Instead, this is a huge friend, the clear silhouette of a human. Danny is continuing to bark at this stranger while he stands in front of me at the door. My worst fear becomes a reality when the door starts to slide open. The next part seriously feels like it came out of a movie, and I was living it firsthand. A man wearing a clown costume peeks through the curtains. Heart pounding at a million miles an hour, I reach for a kitchen knife that was near the sink. However, I don't have to use it because the dude takes off just as quickly as he had entered. My guess is he didn't know he would be dealing with such a large dog, and one side of him sent him packing. I immediately locked the back door, and then I went to check all the doors and windows to ensure they were secure. I then called the police, and they got to my house in about 25 minutes. A little long of a response, if you ask me. Unfortunately, they didn't catch the clown that night, but they did catch him a week later. Turns out he broke into an elderly couple's home. The joke was on him because the homeowner, a retired military veteran, manages to detain the man in the costume, who turned out to be a college student in his early 20s. Apparently himself and his friends were going around the city trying to go into homes and scare people. They claimed they were doing it for fun, but I think it was pretty reckless. What if a homeowner decided they were going to take things into their own hands? Doesn't seem like the best idea in the world, now does it? Number 8. A Grizzly Encounter I'm a single young man who lives out in the Alaskan wilderness. You might be wondering, well what in the world was I doing out there on my own? That's nice of you to want to know, but the simple answer is, I love the great outdoors. Seriously, growing up as a child I always enjoyed camping and running on the trails in the woods. Therefore, after saving up some money after college, I had my uncle help me build a small home on some property that he owned up in the mountains. My uncle is a business owner who sells land and even builds homes on large properties. This was one of the many bits of land he owned in which he wanted to eventually move out there himself. In the meantime, he helped me build my own house first. Of course, this didn't mean I was truly by myself. I had my best friends with me, my Siberian Huskies named Rocky and Chloe. Life here is pretty simple as you might begin to imagine. Most of my day is spent on my computer working. Just because I was out here didn't mean I didn't have cable or internet. So since I worked from home, I was able to get everything I needed to get done there. Anytime I needed something from the store, I would drive 45 minutes down the mountain and I would head into town. I would usually go once a week and I would spend at least $700 on groceries and other things I might need. But with that bit of information, let me tell you about one of the many experiences of living out here. This happened just a few months ago, toward the end of summer. It was toward the end of September and the cool autumn breeze was just beginning to settle in. The long summer days were now beginning to reach their end, and soon we would be welcomed with the dark and our first snow. It was a bummer since I do enjoy the warmer weather but it was one of the things you had to deal with while living out here. I remember looking at the forecast and it showing we would be getting an early snow this year. How weird considering it was at least 60 degrees on this day and it was going to drop to 20 on the following Monday. This didn't stop myself, Rocky, and Chloe from getting one last walk out of the nice weather. I remember getting some fishing gear and deciding we would go ahead and head down to the nearby river to get some fishing done. After all, it would be a perfect end to a perfect summer. Little did I know, things were going to take a turn for the worst. We head out the door at around 3pm and we proceeded to make the 10 minute walk down to the river, 
The trail, so to speak, featured trees as far as the eye could see, and even signs I had put up myself. We make our way down the trail, and finally we arrive to our usual spot. We now take a seat on this nice rock formation, and we proceeded to spend the next hour or so fishing. After some time, I was able to see a family of bears make their way into the river. I'm guessing to do the same thing as me, get some fish. That was one of the many beauties of living out here, being surrounded by nature and being able to see beautiful sights just like that. I forget exactly how much more time went by, but Rocky and Chloe step away and head down the river. This was when I went ahead and take out my iPod and listen to some music. Big mistake. You see, one of the many rules I forgot about was never using earphones when you're in the middle of nowhere. You never know if someone or something might be sneaking up on you. As I sat there listening to the many wonders of audiobooks, I hadn't become aware of my visitor slowly approaching my little campsite. Obviously, since I was fishing, I had the fish in a cooler not too far from me. Suddenly, I had this feeling that I should turn around, and as I do, you'll never guess what I was face to face with. A fully grown bear, staring right at me, slowly making its way toward me. Now, unless you've been in a situation like this, then you may never know the feeling of complete fear. I mean, bears are interesting. Either they had their good day, or their not so good day. I remember I sat there frozen, not knowing on what I should do. If I get to move, that might cause them to suddenly react and charge. I wouldn't stand a chance. As the bear started getting closer to me, I could suddenly hear my dogs in the distance. I slowly turned around and I can see them running over to me with a purpose. In a quick and sudden movement, I kicked the cooler to the side, causing the fish to fall over. Then I jumped down into the nearby river. I'll tell you. That water was so cold that as soon as I got out, I just wanted to run to warm up. Not that I would need an excuse to do so. So Rocky and Chloe, with all the bravery they had, run up to our grizzly friend and proceed to bark like there's no tomorrow. This, I believe, catches it off guard, because it takes off running, but of course not before grabbing one of the fish. Talk about a close encounter. I quickly got out of the water and run up to my dog so happy that they had literally saved me from trouble. If it weren't for them barking, warning me, or running over here, then I don't even want to begin to imagine what might have happened. Anyways, once I realized the bear was gone, I quickly grabbed my things and we make a mad dash down the trail and back home. Sadly, I did get sick after being out in the cold. But on the bright side, it did give me an excuse to take a break from work. So that's my story. As I mentioned, it's now winter time, so the bears are asleep. In the meantime, I'll take time to relax with Rocky and Chloe until the sun comes up again. Who knows, maybe next summer I'll have another story for you. Hopefully, it won't be as crazy as this. Number 9. Cat Saves Me they say that courage can come in different forms. That statement is true, especially when you listen to the experience I'm about to tell you about. So, a little bit about myself. I was a fairly recent college student who just began attending university out of state. I'm originally from Oklahoma, but I was studying in Southern California. During my time out there, it did take a while for me to get used to things. But as the semester went by, I got fairly used to it. I made many friends and I got along great with my professors. The one such friend I would meet, I believe truly saved me from something bad. Now, I had school in the evenings, so my mornings and mid-afternoons were spent either studying or working at a little coffee shop next to the campus. The job was fairly simple and I would get used to seeing the regular customers. One such customer was actually a neighborhood cat who we ended up calling Leo. Leo was a cat that lived in the nearby neighborhood, and for some reason he would always stop by every morning to visit us. It first started off with me giving him some warm milk and bread, and after a couple of days he seemed to have become part of our coffee shop family. We welcomed him with open arms, and we started buying him cat food to feed him every morning. As far as we knew, he had no owner, as he didn't have a collar on him. He just seemed to be a friendly cat who liked visiting. Okay, 
Well, the reason I mentioned Leo was because he was going to play quite the role one evening. Like I mentioned before, I was attending school at night, so by the time I'd finished my last lecture, it was close to 11pm. Quite late to be writing papers, but it's how my schedule fit best. Leaving campus to get to my dorm, I had to go down a series of side streets and an alleyway that would lead me by the coffee shop. From there, the dorms were right across the street. Well, after saying goodnight to my fellow classmates, I now begin the lonesome walk to my dorm. Even though the campus offered lamps and lights, they were sort of far from one another, and they didn't exactly provide the best lighting. This meant that someone could easily be hiding in the dark corner, or better yet, in the alleyway. So I'm now walking off campus and heading nearby the coffee shop, where I see a familiar friend. There was Leo. As he sat down staring off into the night, he immediately recognized me and he walked up to me, giving me a friendly acknowledgement that his friend was here. I stay around for a few minutes, until it was time to leave. This time Leo follows me down the road, but I knew that I couldn't take him back to the dorm. As far as I knew, pets weren't allowed. I figured, maybe on this night I could let him in, then tomorrow morning I can take him back to the coffee shop. As we are walking down the alleyway, I notice what looked like someone who sat in one of the dark corners. He appeared to be drinking, and he now got up after noticing I was walking there. Really, I was doing my best to ignore him, and just walked past him. This was when I noticed Leo started letting out a hissing sound, the kind cats make when they're angry. Well, I'm surprised when the man seems to break the bottle next to a dumpster, then he proceeds to head toward me with said broken bottle. He kept saying things like give me your wallet and don't say anything. I mean, come on, really? You expected me not to say anything? Right there and then, Leo jumps and scratches this man's face, causing him to stumble back. I take the chance to run with Leo, who follows me soon after. We eventually make it to the dorm, where first thing I do is call campus security. You can bet they found him pretty easily. After all, I don't think you can hide with cat scratches on your face. But yeah, to say I was thankful for Leo helping me there is definitely an understatement. In a strange turn of events, I was actually allowed to keep Leo there with me, and soon he became part of my family. I even took Leo back home with me to Oklahoma, where he now spends his days running around on our property. Number 10. The Research Facility the submission was featured on the Creepy Fox in early 2018, but I ended up deleting the video it was included in. Therefore, I wanted to go ahead and bring it back for those of you who are new subscribers, so I hope you enjoy this blast from the past. My submission takes us back to 7 years ago, when my friends and I were in our teens. We attended school in a small town in the state of Washington. Anyone from a small town can attest to knowing there isn't really much to do, and it was worse during the summer. One evening I was feeling especially mischievous. I had pondered about an idea, about breaking into this abandoned research facility on the other side of town. My friends were pretty hesitant. Wait a minute, wait. Are you serious? Do you know how bad of an idea that is? They said with insistence. I mean, yeah, it was. That was the whole point. Anyways, in total, it's three of us, and we first spent our afternoon playing video games. After a while, the idea of exploring the abandoned facility became reality, as my friends became more open to the plan. Thus, we waited until nightfall, and we began our adventure. We walked across town since none of us had a driver's license, and we'd take a trail that had a big red sign that said, no trespassing. Once we reach the end, we just need to cross this field. And there was the building. It was large, four stories, with four wings on each floor. As expected, any form of entry had long since been blocked off, creating a problem for my group. How in the world could we get inside the building? Well, that's when we put our minds together and we think of something a little bit more on the creative side. After a minute of brainstorming, we walk to the back of the building and we take notice to a balcony on the second floor. In order to reach it, we would have to do a bit of climbing. 
no problem for some adventurous teenagers. We would climb onto a metal shipping crate, and then we would hoist each other up. Then we would shimmy across a ledge, and we would get onto the balcony. Admittedly, I was a bit uncomfortable while I waited for my friends to climb. Looking back, I think it was just the overall emotion that came over me of exploring this abandoned research facility. Anyways, there was an open doorway with complete darkness inside, and I used my flashlight to illuminate my view. A rush of excitement then comes over me. My friends finally managed to join me on the balcony, and together, we make our way in. Within moments, we realize it would have been a great idea to have brought masks. After all, the smell was like something I can't even begin to describe to you. The halls were aligned with pens that used to hold monkeys, and I'd never seen anything like it before. The floors were even covered in debris. Things such as glass and rubble, just to name a few. Honestly, with each step we took, it was easy for our imaginations to get the best of us, especially in a place like this. We explore the second floor, and the main floor pretty quickly, and then we decided to head to the basement. Perhaps it had more to offer. It sure did, but not what we expected. Water. And I mean, lots of it. The whole basement was flooded. It was knee high, murky, and green. Well, I sure didn't feel like going for a swim, and neither did my friends. So we decided to head to the third floor. This was when for the very first time, we ended up hearing something strange. We followed the source until we discovered a speaker making a continuous crackling sound. The speaker appeared to have been placed in a children's playroom, but under the circumstances of this once building's operations, it was for monkeys. There were old toys laying around and the walls had cartoon-like clowns on what remained of the old and torn wallpaper. I took this opportunity to take out a spray can that I took from my dad's tool bench, where I proceeded to graffiti. However, things were about to take a turn for the worse. Dude, stop. I think I hear something. We went silent and listened with a purpose. Five minutes of waiting, and we are startled out of our shoes by one of the loudest slams we had ever heard. This was from the floor beneath us, by the way. Then... We hear something moving around. I get the butterflies in my stomach, and I see my friend's face go pale. It was obvious we weren't alone, and we needed to leave if it was the last thing we did. Best case scenario, we get caught by the police. Worst case scenario, we bump into someone who might have had bad intentions. Now, we can't go down the stairs because the floor beneath us was where the sounds were being made, so we decided our best course of action was to head to the roof and hide. Perhaps we would be able to find a way to the first floor from there, we thought. Luckily, once we're up there, we end up finding a ladder. It was a bit of a drop to the second story balcony, but nothing we couldn't handle. Once on the second floor, we shimmy across the ledge and off the metal crate we had originally used to get onto the building. Let me just say that running back into the forest and onto the trail was one of the biggest signs of relief that had ever come to us thus far. Now, as we're catching our breath and beginning to comprehend what it was we experienced, we noticed there were no police cars outside the building, let alone any cars in general. The worst part is we thought that's who we were running away from. Maybe somebody saw us break in and they call officers, but no. Anyways, that was the scariest night of our lives. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying today's episode. Before we continue, I want to take this opportunity to thank my channel members, Robbie, Bo, Kim, Spunky the Nutcase, Ingrid, Evil's Girl, Corey, Zombie Mama, Haiti, Benjamin, Scott, Sean, Conqueror Super 1990, and our newest channel members, Vicky and Hunt24. Now, if you'd like to help support what I do here, along with getting early video access and a video shout-out, then check out the channel memberships option. It's right next to where it says subscribe. Anyways, that's it for today. <laughs> 